there she is. She's back. She's ready for more. It's Kristen Hanna. Kristen, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good. I feel like I have to I I, I have to introduce you as like former president, Super Bowl champion, or <laughs> best-selling author, Kristen Hanna. I, just, I can't leave that out uh, many times over. I was trying to do some quick counting to figure out how many books you've written and it's mm. too many to count yeah. at least that, quickly what do you know do you have the number come on no that's why everything says more than 20 okay that's, well that's, that's enough i gave up yeah that's enough so all right you're back at it i interviewed you i'm pretty sure for your last book it feels like about a week ago but i think it was probably about a year and a half when when did uh th what what yeah oh god okay that's all right. <laughs> This is what happens. Ago. Okay, this is what happens. <laughs> All right. Well, I, that actually, I'm glad to hear that because you've written another whopper, The yeah. Women. I'm very interested to talk to you about this. Um, as soon as I started reading it, I immediately thought of a woman I know named Sarah Blum, who is very much like a, one of the characters and sort of in this character of this book, in that she was a Vietnam vet. Uh, nurse and she has dedicated her life to it afterwards and it was it really defined her life so I thought about her as, as you as I dove into this book talk to me about because yeah, ideas come to you topics you like to dive into history women in history I'm sad to say Vietnam is now history but apparently <laughs> it is <laughs> apparently it is let me ask you before we get into that what I think you're my age ish you're probably a little younger I don't know I don't know, but no, I don't know. But what was your thoughts on Vietnam while it was happening? Because you were young like me when it was going on. Yeah, I mean, that's really what started this this whole journey. I um, let's see. So I was in elementary school during the yeah. Vietnam War, yeah. going up into you know middle school, and um, so it 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 cast a big shadow over our lives back then, even as kids, you know, we, there were the three channels on television yeah. and we watched the news and we were aware of the po the protests. My parents were a little more, you know, hippie fringy than some of them, but a lot of my girlfriend's dads were serving over there. Oh, and in wow. fact, um, my closest friend, when I was uh, living in a, in Port Angeles, Washington, her father was shot down. And wow. so I was about 10 years old, 10 or 11, I think, when I got the his prisoner of war bracelet. Wow. And so I wore that, you know, for years and years and years, which meant that, you know, as I was growing up and coming of age and, you know, going to the University of Washington and everything else, his name was always on my wrist as that reminder. Wow. Um, and then I remembered, of course, um, and I experienced how the veterans were treated when they came home. Yeah. And even as a child, it was shocking and, and, and memorable. And so I've really spent like the bulk of my writing an adult life wanting to write this book really really yeah what took you so long <laughs> well <laughs> i i actually pitched it to an editor in 1997 and uh she said you aren't old enough and you aren't good enough so come back when you are really and, oh. yeah and and oh. she was you know entirely right she had been oh. at berkeley in 1968 and ah. so she, this was a, you know, a subject that was very close to her and it took a while. And as you know, there was a long period of time where it was very clear that we didn't want to read about Vietnam. No. We didn't want to hear about it. And so I just kept waiting um, for the moment to say, OK, this this everything is now ready. Let's start. Do you know Carl Marlantes? He's a Washingtonian. Have you met Carl? I have not met him, but he read the book for me. And so we've really? been in touch. Yeah, oh. he's a great guy. Carl's a great guy. I interviewed him when he published um, Matterhorn. And he said the same thing, which was that people didn't want to, they were like, set it in Afghanistan, set it in Iraq, yeah. but do not set it in, in Vietnam. Nobody wants right. to hear about it. Well, but it's history now. Now it's history. So yeah. people can read about that in the Civil War. And it's all the same yeah. thing. Well, you know, it's interesting to me because I grew up in Providence. You grew, So you grew up in Washington. You grew up in... Right. Okay. And I grew up in Providence and, you know, I was, I guess I am a little younger than you, but cause I was, it was over. I remember 
wishing for the war to end on like my seventh birthday when I blew out the oh. couch. But I actually wasn't that politically active. But in my mind, in my imagination, the all of America was against the war. Of course, that wasn't the yeah. case, but my the way I was raised mm -hmm. and what I saw, and it's only as I've gotten older that I've understood that there was considerable division amongst not amongst the population itself about whether it was a good idea, bad idea. And particularly, I'm sure, for people growing up around army bases where even though they're dying, there's a kind of inherent patriotism in in the soldier's life, yeah? Well, and, you know, you're also talking about, um, you know, a decade, um, essentially, yeah. and, and a real sea change in America from how they felt about it at the beginning to how they felt about it at the end. Yeah. And this is the era... Um, of Americans realizing, I think for the first time, really, that their government was lying to them, that they yeah. were not being told the truth. And yeah. and that, of course, sparked so much division and, you know, and, and political drama. Yeah. And so, yeah, it, it, that's the way it felt to me as a kid, too. Yeah. Um, but that's not entirely true. I think it's also hard for us to understand the the way communism the threat it seen it, it posed the kind of threat it was it's easy to look back now and mock it but at the time no one knew how the wall was going to come down right. and i think it was a bigger deal than i understood i watched a documentary on the vietnam war and i said oh i see why it would seem like a good idea you know from a yeah. certain lens so well, and you got to remember this is the you know the late 50s is the era of building bomb shelters yeah. in your backyard yeah. and and actually you know being afraid of nuclear fallout and nuclear war and and communists being you know the great threat you know cuz you're like me you must have grown up it's a funny thing i was just writing about it and i was talking to my kids about it which is like it was weird i grew up thinking at any moment it could happen. Like it, I, I didn't actually sit around worrying about it, but that was the kind of threat that hovered over our lives for until like about 1990, give or yeah. take, right? It yeah, was exactly. very strange way to live. Okay. So like I said, I have this friend, this woman, she's a writer and she really dedicated her life. So the, if you wanted to serve your country in the Vietnam war and you're a woman, there really aren't many choices, right? It's kind of nurse. What were there other kind of probably clerical and stuff, but in terms of really, serving it seemed like nurse was one of your best options the, yeah the lion's share of the women who served in country were nurses but there were also special services yeah. red cross you know yeah. there were other women there but the 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 most likely would have been as a nurse right and so when you said you've been wanting to write this for a while you you had the the bracelet but that's a man who died were you but you write about women did you know you wanted to write about women in Vietnam or you just wanted to write about Vietnam, how, whether it's the home front or whatever, how did, what was your drive? It really, it was always this idea that I wanted to write about the era and, yeah. and the war within the context of the era. And yeah. so that idea sort of changed over time. And as I got older and, and just became more of an adult, became a mother, you know, um, learned more about our own history. But yeah. it was really in 2020 when we in Seattle had just gone into lockdown. So I had turned in the four winds, my previous book. Right. And, and here we are now in Seattle. I live on a small island. So we're we're really locked in. You're double lockdown. Yes, yeah, so there's like nowhere to go. <laughs> Right. And and I'm watching the news, of course, and the level of anger and division and political divide right. felt just, you know, inescapable at that time. Yep. Um, and then on top of that, I'm watching our medical personnel, the nurses and the doctors, right. pushed to the very edge right. and not getting the support that they um that they needed, you know, and, and them having to deal with the day-to-day -day difficulties while all of these arguments were going on around them. Right. And it just, it was like a door opened and I went, oh, this feels like 
the Vietnam era again, and nurses are the way to tell my story. Wow. Wow. So you were really inspired by the times. I was going to ask you if you saw any any connection between that time and this time. And in fact, you were inspired by it. I would say probably, it seems like, I don't know, because I didn't, I haven't paid that close attention, but it seems like what we went through with COVID and who was president at that time and the way we the line was drawn, that seems like the most intensely acrimonious and divided we've been in my lifetime that I or in my adult lifetime that I can think of, frankly. I mean, I think you have to look to the the Vietnam era to find something that's close. Yeah, I think so, too. So, you know, I always think, so, OK, you want to write this. But, you know, so here's one of the challenges that struck me that you might have writing this book, which is you obviously you're sympathetic to the characters you're writing about. You want to rep, you know, these are as you know, the the it's the missing, the forgotten, the brave. So we've got, right. you know, obviously these are our heroes, our heroines, but you got to tell a good story. And so you can you want to represent them. You want to present them, but you can't just lionize them where it becomes, you know, it's boring. And so you still got to tell a good story. So did you find yourself wrestling with that, like having to pull back on making on on giving them sainthood or anything, or was it easy? <laughs> well, you know, that's it's it's always the challenge when you write historical fiction. And yeah. yes, I do have to comment that the seventies as historical fiction um, <laughs> feels a little odd, doesn't um, it? <laughs> but you're always sort of challenged because you want to basically you know, use the historical record and try to be as close to accurate um, and, and historically accurate as you can. Right. But then on top of that, you also have to tell a story about people, about, you know, people in conflict, humans in conflict, character arcs and the, cha you know, changes that characters go through. But in this particular book, it was... It was pretty easy once I decided what I wanted to tackle and what I wanted to tackle was this naive woman who's raised in a patriotic, military proud family, um, volunteers to serve in Vietnam, assuming that she will be treated in the same way that her brother was treated when he went to Vietnam. Right. And then, you know, she goes over there, she experiences the horrors of war. And then she comes home expecting to be um, arriving to the same world that she left. And in right. fact, she comes home to this world that is angry and divisive and marching and protesting. And not only are they not grateful or thankful for her service and for the service of men and women like her, but they are actively um, angry about it. So the nurses caught it too. This is always amazing. Yeah. I can get the soldiers because there's images of the American soldiers <laughs> killing children, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Right. But the nurses got it too. Didn't matter. If you wore the uniform, someone was going to get mad at you. It was really shocking. You know, that was one of the things that surprised me the most in my research. I mean, because I felt the same thing, like, OK, well, they're going to, you know, we know that the male vets had been treated this way, right. regardless of really when they came home. Right. But you would think that women in a nursing uniform would be treated right. slightly differently by, you know, um, Mr. and Mrs. America. <laughs> And when I spoke to them, you know, the nurses, almost all of them had stories about being spit upon, about being flipped off, about being yelled at, you know, all of the the things that the men vets were experiencing, right. the women were experiencing also. You know, I know this is going to sound odd, but it gives me a uh, strange solace hearing this because, hear me out, hear me out, okay. when I hear about this outrageous behavior, it reminds me when I see outrageous behavior now, I think this is nothing new. This is hum This is what people do, a certain kinds of people do. So don't be scared when you see it happening in, in your own, like with the people screaming at the nurses trying to go help right. people in the hospitals now. Like this is, there's a certain part of humanity that just does this for whatever reason. And you know what else I also take some solace in is we were like this in the Vietnam era and then we weren't. Right. You know, so right. I like to believe that we can be like this now 
and that some at some point we all take a collective breath and say this is not who we are this is not who we want to be yeah. something has to give and it's usually um it's usually a not you know some version of listening and empathy and and understanding our commonality instead of our differences you know and it's you know it's interesting i i so i write and i write personal essays but i always tell my students i'm not writing about me i want my reader to think the stories about them in some way they should feel like it's about them and that's because i they're not i'm not going to write about a middle-aged white guy i'm going to write about a per like just humanity like i don't want people just to look and sound like me and it's not that hard you know it's actually not that hard to find that common thread within us all and i think writers have to do that all the time well and that's i think the that is the true gift of fiction, especially fiction that explores issues like the women or times like these. Yeah. Um, because what it allows you to do is, you know, you can stand in the shoes of someone who is completely not like you in terms of, you know, so many things, but you both share a love for your children or a love for your family or a passion right. for your job, whatever it is. And if we as writers can create empathy, then I think that's a great hedge against this, um, you know, the demonization of the other, which is what causes yeah. us so many problems as a it's, society. It has been, I remember I was, my, I had to homeschool one of my kids. We had to study Rome. I thought, let's study Rome. So we, and I was like, oh, well, they were going through it too, apparently. Like that, <laughs> the Germans were the others, the barbarians were the other. I was like, it's as, it's as old as time itself. You know, th speaking of that, as I always think about, when I think about war, there's a quote by Hemingway describing um, the uh, uh, Red Badge of Courage and how he didn't like it because he felt like it was a description of war by someone who'd never been to war. Then he, you know, because he famously went to World War One and wrote about it. And then I think about Karl Marlante's portrayal of, and which was so vivid because of course he had lived through it but you haven't gone to war and so you have to write about it was there any intimidation about having to do it based on all the different sources you get or do you just strap on and go yeah I mean that's that's what I do you know that's my yeah. job so it really comes down to finding the right resources finding the right material reading everything i can get my hands on and then i like to say like it's my job to do the research so you don't have to <laughs> and and then it all goes through like my imagination and 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 my morality and my thoughts and my yeah. beliefs and and it comes out um hopefully feeling completely authentic and of course right. if you teach writing you know that so much of that of, of creating that in a work is creating a sensory world you know yeah and and world building and yeah. that's the part i really like so actually of the two halves of this book the war was a lot easier to write than coming home interesting because that was almost you said world building it's so funny because when i think of world building i think of fantasy and science I fiction so building the world but really in a way you're doing that too because you're having to say here's this place that might as well be a foreign land for, or another world because it's so distant from where we are now in a time that is distant and you love the bringing that strange exotic place to life tactily Visually, I mean, sensual. I think that's why I went to historical because I'm a huge fantasy geek. Oh, you are? Oh, oh I didn't know that. Yeah. Really? I mean, yeah. Oh, okay. You, you know, I love all that stuff. I love fantasy. I love world building. I came of age in the 70s, you right. know, with right. Stranger in a Strange Land and yeah. Dune and all those books. Yeah. And that's really what historical fiction is to me because I'm taking a world that is like ours, but not. And, yeah. you know, trying to anchor it both in reality and in a kind of fantasy. Do you think, so how, it's interesting with every writer's different, how how uh, vocal and how uh, communicative are your readers? Do they like to reach out to you? Do you hear from them a lot? Do they show up oh, at readings? Yeah. <laughs> how is, how? first of all, just how are they in general? They're amazing, you know, because honestly, I truly believe that readers are amazing. Um, and of course, I number myself in this group. And so yeah. I think people who 
who read widely, who read voraciously, and who connect with the authors that they love. I mean, there's a real sense of community there that I love. So, and they've been supportive from the beginning. But yeah. of course, you know, for the first 10 years of my career, I had no idea what anyone thought. You know, we used to live in a world where <laughs> off went your book and you never heard of it again. And then right. you went on to the next one. Right. Whereas now stuff like this is out there and yeah. and Instagram and Facebook, yeah. um, which I'm on. So, uh, yeah, you, you hear quite a bit. Good, bad and ugly. Yeah, you get to hear. Well, I was just wondering because, I mean. Obviously, you're all over, you, you've explored a lot of different times, but this is such a particular time in America. I don't know. I would assume your readers, readers who like historical tend to skew a little older, but I don't know if like how many of your readers will have lived through this, how many of them will be new to this. I'm just, I'm, I'm wondering if you're anticipating a different kind of response to this than to your other stuff. It's been, it's been really interesting because one of the things I, an early reader said to me was the book sort of falls in three camps. So there, there are the people who are one generation older than me, and they lived through this. A right. lot of them either served or didn't serve or protested. You know, they have all kinds of memories. So yeah. for them, the book hits very close to home. Right. And then there's, you know, my sort of generation where we remember bits and pieces of it, but but what I'm hearing is this book puts the whole landscape together, exactly yeah. like you were saying, like your perception in your part of the country is one thing. Right. And this book tells you what was going on in a lot of parts of the country. Yeah. And then I'm hearing from people my son's age and younger who literally know nothing except Apocalypse Now right. and Platoon. Right. And right. so they are um, they are stunned and angry at the way um, the veterans were treated. That's what yeah. I'm hearing most routinely from them. Yeah, that is interesting because I realized in my lifetime, I really saw it go from soldiers were kind of the bad guys in, right. in line with like the cops and there were other nicknames for cops yeah. which were not so nice to it su it slowly changed to now the the to the saluting and all that but right. the, but that was it was an evolution that took some took i don't know about 20 years to kind of rehabilitate that it seems like and and it's at the very least you know and i've written about this in several books and several time periods yeah um regardless of what one's personal experiences or personal feelings are, if you are asking, you know, American men, women, and families to make this kind of sacrifice on our behalf, yeah. um, there is absolutely no excuse for us as a nation not to then take care of them when I, they get home. Oh, well, I totally agree. It's like if you want them to do it, you you pay it, you pay up, right. pay up, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> and you take care. It's like I know you want them to go to war, now pay for it. That's and right. The whole thing. So okay, so we couldn't count the number of books. We know it's over twenty. <laughs> Still having fun. Still having Still fun. Having, Chris? Oh. Are you? I mean, can you imagine a better job? No, it's, I can't. It's but great. So you you get up, and how much time does Kristen Hanna, best-selling novelist? have to spend on this kind of nonsense. How much of this do you have to do? I mean, look, of course, talking to me is a special category, of course, of but, course. but you know, there's this Instagram and the Facebook and the, and how much can you just write and not have to deal with that stuff? You know, it's a, it's an ever changing landscape. Um, and you know, it, 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 uh, what, six years ago, like when it was Nightingale, 10, yeah. six, 10 years ago, you would go on book tour. I would go on book tour for two weeks and then right. I would come back home and get back to work. Right. And then came COVID and the rise of the Zoom yeah. landscape. Yeah. And so now what's happening, at least with this book, is I'm doing a lot of these um, every day for like the three weeks leading up to it. Right. Um, which is, in my opinion, 
infinitely better than <laughs> spending a lot of time on the road. Um, I, don't, you know, I don't ever want to leave my bedroom now. I, I don't know. want to leave my office. This is what's happened to me. Yes. And you only have to like, I mean, I have my pajamas on. It, right, no right. one knows. So, right, so that's right. great. Yeah. Um, but there is a lot more at, at my level now. Um, sales go on a lot longer. So there's there's a lot more publicity stuff to do. But right. when it ends, and it should end, you know, like mid-March, let's say, right. um, I won't have a whole lot to do for two years. And that's right. my time to start writing again. Yeah, yeah. But, and do you ever, you don't do, um, I don't know, do you do like book clubby type stuff? Do you ever... People willing to shell out some dough and have Kristen zoom into there. <laughs> I think at this no. point, no, you don't do that. <laughs> Not too much. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. But you're still having fun. You're still having fun. I do. Uh, yeah, <gasps> it's just it's still just a great job. You know, um, I'm a little concerned as to where I go from here because mm. this is a pretty um, personal and and powerful book to me. So. Now I gotta try to find something I like even better. I haven't found it yet. So how? Like, so we'll 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 end there, kind of. So how do you sniff? We can't panic, right? You oh, gotta. I do. I oh, do. you do. Okay, so it's a little bit of panic because I, I do. You, I don't know. Do you send co sign contracts? You're like, we need a book by X kind of thing, or do they say give us one when you can? Well, um, I sign like three book deals which means they cover, you know, six to nine years. So I yeah. have to, I'm picking dates in the future. Right. But, and I, I am a former lawyer, so deadlines mean a lot to me. Right. I really <laughs> right. like to make deadlines. Right, right. But now sometimes like books like The Four Winds and The Nightingale, they keep selling in hardcover for a lot longer, which gives yeah. me extra time that's nice that is yeah. boy selling in hardcover ain't that sweet i know it is <laughs> ain't that it's sweet? Very do, you lucky. Get, do you get a lot of ebook sales i don't know if you track this kind of stuff um i don't track it all right it, it, okay let's <laughs> not know. let's not talk about such things <laughs> let us not talk about such things all right what i want to know so okay so the, the how does how does Kristen get how, how do they come along how do they come along for you what do you have a process or you just say god please <laughs> so every night you say a prayer it's like wine and desperation oh, okay that's pretty much and i think you know my good friend megan chance oh yeah, yeah and yeah. so we do a lot of wine drinking and whining and talking to try to to help each other get through to find the idea that that i know is in the subconscious somewhere right but i tend not to listen we got to get out of the way. We got to yep, get out of the right. way. We got to get out. Everybody knows it. Well, I have complete faith that it, <laughs> it will get out of the way. I will find and it. And may, maybe all the noise of promoting this one is cluttering it up. And when you can finally yeah. take a breath, there it'll be. There it'll be. See, isn't it great? All right. Listen, waiting. so the book is The Women. Get it, people. You won't be able to put it down once you pick it up. You won't be able to put it down. And, and and by the way, congrats. I know somebody optioned it somewhere. Didn't is it? Did I hear correctly? Yep. Warner I don't Brothers. know what that means. We never I know what either. that. We, okay. But it's nice. They have to pay you at least for the option. So that's good. Right. All right. Well, let's cross our fingers that I turn on Netflix in a few years. And there it is. Um, okay. So, but my question, uh, I, I probably asked it before. I'm going to ask it again. I don't care if writing, all the writing you've done, you've done so much has taught you anything about being a person, about being, about life. What has it taught you? You know, it has taught me to listen carefully to everything, wait a moment to formulate formulate my opinion, and then uh, and then speak when I think I actually have something to say. 